All right, so thanks for the introduction and thank you to Binary District and to Norgos for hosting this event in this lovely space. Um, so as you said mentioned, um, I'm an economist who works in blockchain. I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, I was actually, I think the title, the technical title of this half hour is something like a super technical introduction to crypto economics. Um, so there won't be any math, but I'm gonna sort of dig into the types of things that we um, work on as a firm with respect to economics and blockchain. All right, so first, you know, who am I? Why am I standing here? Um, so I'm a founding economist of Prism Group. Uh, we do, we are a firm that does economics and governance design for blockchain platforms and distributed ledger projects. Um, we came together about 18 months ago, so I did a PhD in economics at Harvard. Um, and one of my co-founders and I, you know, as we started learning more about blockchain, we realized, similar to what was just said, that there's actually a lot of really interesting economics in here, even more so than, you know, the price dynamics of a, a crypto token. So um, at Prism Group, we, do, we divide our time among advising various projects, um, doing some research and research presentations, and also doing some education. So things like this, bringing sort of some of the more interesting pieces of economics um, to the blockchain space. Uh, for those of you who were um, consensus on the first day, you may have seen a panel at 9 a.m. with a bunch of very esteemed economists um, that was moderated by my business partner, and that was a lot of fun. Right. I promise I'll figure out how this works. Okay, so again, you know, why is this exciting? You know, for almost every blockchain project that we speak with, you know, they're building some kind of economy written in code. If you think about, you know, what are people trying to achieve when they build a, you know, design a blockchain platform? Maybe you have miners who are coming to provide energy and services in exchange for pay and they want to make a profit. Or maybe you're building a decentralized marketplace where buyers and sellers are going to work together to create value. I mean, this is all about bringing people together for economic transactions to create value. And so this is really exciting for a number of reasons. I think one of the things that's very cool is that, you know, from my point of view, a lot of people who work in economics, you know, um, after you finish your, your degree, you maybe you go off to the Fed or you go off to um, Amazon, and you're, you're sort of working on a piece of, an, of a market or a piece of an economy. And here we're really thinking about how do we want to design economic systems from the ground up. And that's just an incredibly exciting place to be, so I think it's really cool. You know, one of the main differences that I see between sort of the economic and computer science approach to designing blockchain platforms is the way that um, the understanding of individual behavior is approached. Um, so when you think about, there are different branches of economics, but if you think about microeconomics, um, it's really founded on trying to understand how individuals make choices. Um, so people, you like to say people have free will, they can make decisions based on what they perceive to, you know, give them the highest payoff. Um, and it's very dangerous to assume that people are going to do what you want them to do just because it's beneficial for you. It also has to be beneficial to them. Um, and so a lot of times when we work with projects, there's fantastic technology, there's a great idea, and we focus more on how do we know that the users and the miners and all of the token holders are going to behave in the way that you want them to. And so, you know, you might say we're a little bit of the harbinger of doom when it comes to design. You know, we're going to try to find every way that behavior could break your system. Um, I'll dig more into this later, but you know, some of the topics that we you know, get asked about frequently um, with respect to economic design and blockchain are, you know, first, incentives. You know, how do you get people to show up and use your platform and then use it in the way that it's intended? Right, so I know, I'm sure we've all heard of projects where you know, they launch and despite the best intentions of the founders, you know, someone discovers a money pump or something and the platform has to shut down. You know, they post it on Reddit and all of a sudden tokens are being taken out of the system. You know, how do you prevent those types of things from happening? You know, second, of course, how do you think about designing a token? You know, how do you design one that does what you want it to do? And then third, governance, as you know, is becoming a, a much bigger deal as we um, you know, more platforms are launched and they want to evolve over time. All right, so for the rest of the time, I want to focus sort of on two pieces. Um, I'm going to talk about two different sections. The first is, 
you know, economic design is, is quite complex. Um, I'm going to show you a, a diagram later that has multiple parts, and each part has won like five Nobel Prizes. Um, but I'm going to start with just a few ways that we see generally that design can go wrong. So sort of some, some bigger themes that we see to sort of words of wisdom as we talk with different projects. And then second, I'm going to talk sort of at a high level about how we think about economic design. And this is, again, um, as I'll say in a bit, you know, assuming that there's a project that really has its value proposition, it's got its technology team, and how do you make sure that the economics is going to support the overall mission of the platform? Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes the machine also does not behave the way you want. Okay. There we go. First part. All right. Um, so the first, um, this is probably my favorite slide that we've ever had made for PRISM. Um, this is the blockchain rebel. Um, and so the first misconception that we see around economic design in the blockchain space is that introducing design is the same as reducing freedom, right? And so there's a lot of, obviously, there's a libertarian streak in a lot of people who you know, chose to work with blockchain, and there's an idea that we don't want to restrict what people are allowed to do. And, um, you know, there's a thought that sort of maybe if we, you know, restrict the parameters of choice, if we specify that, you know, auctions have to take a certain form or we're using a certain pricing mechanism or we help people, you know, buyers and sellers find each other through recommendation engines, that this is restrictive and bad. But actually, these types of tools can actually help to empower your users to make better decisions, right? They can help people to use your platform um, in the way that you want. And there's actually examples of economic design and specifically the design of markets sort of everywhere in our daily lives. Um, it's one of those things that once you become aware of it, you become obsessed with it and it's all over the place. So just a couple of non-blockchain examples Okay, so the first one, just as an example, um, have anybody in here an eBay user? We've got a couple, maybe a quarter. So I, I've had an eBay shop for years, and I always like dispute resolution, but I never really thought about it as an economic mechanism. So dispute resolution, you know, if you buy or sell something on eBay and something goes wrong, you go to this webpage, and they have a couple of sort of pre-programmed things where it says my item hasn't come, nobody paid me, um, and then there's a button that says my problem is not listed here. And there's a little bit of sort of a pre-programmed process, but you very quickly get to a person. And the person has a lot of power. The person can kick you off the eBay platform, they can erase reviews of you, they can do all sorts of stuff. Now this is expensive. And eBay is a for-profit company, they don't do this because they just love people. This adds economic value, right? This helps to build trust that I'm willing to buy a teapot from someone who lives halfway around the world I've never met in my life, right? I know that there's recourse. And so because I have confidence that transactions are going to progress well and they're, they have a higher probability of succeeding, I'm more willing to engage in them. A second example that most of us, I'm guessing, have encountered is actually the Netflix recommendation engine. So this is not a two-sided market. This is me deciding what to watch. So originally, Netflix did not have a recommendation engine, as I'm sure many of you re remember. You just log on and you just look for whatever you wanted to watch. And what Netflix actually found was that the catalog, unless you were a cinephile, you know, unless you were Roger Ebert, the catalog was so overwhelming that people would spend you know, a couple minutes looking around, trying to find something they wanted to watch. And if they didn't find anything, they'd leave. And then they cancel their subscription. And so this was actually, the original challenge was motivated by the fact that they did not want people canceling. And so they thought, okay, how do we build a system where we look at you, know, you, we look at people like you, we look at what people like you like, and then we show that to you on the front page so that maybe you'll find something you actually want to watch. And this is an example of what you might call market design. of just thinking about how do you, you know, and in a way this is kind of you know, freedom reducing and rather than just you know, I'm going to be sorely tempted to watch more Star Trek because it's like the first thing here. Um, but it can actually add to the value that I get from using this. And the second sort of um, what I call a misconception is that there are a lot of projects that are starting to think more about economic design, especially around governance. You see, sort of, I think of sort of governance phase one as 
platforms launching, you know, you could think of Bitcoin where a platform launches and there's not really governance. And then as the platform goes along, you know, the core developers or whoever have to figure out how to make changes to the protocol. Um, the second wave of governance is you see more platforms designing governance specifically. And one thing we see here is um, there's a tendency to sort of cut and paste governance. So you'll say, okay, well, we need a way for people to make decisions, so we're gonna vote. And there's a voting mechanism that works, you know, for federal elections, that looks good, we'll put it here. And one of the lessons, if you dig into this type of design, is that a lot of mechanism design is extremely customized. And if you talk to, you know, professors who, you know, work in this space, um, and this is one of the topics discussed on the panel on Monday morning, um, they're sort of obsessive about every detail of the environment to make sure that the voting mechanism or the pricing mechanism or whatever it is you're planning to use is gonna function in that very specific environment. And so copying and pasting can be a great motivation, but you also have to figure out you know, how it's gonna work. Actually, the reason for this picture is I kind of refer, I refer to this as the borrowed suit problem. So sort of like, suppose you're going somewhere and you need to wear a suit. Like you can borrow somebody's suit and if they're about your size, it might fit you, but it's probably not gonna fit you really great. And if you're going somewhere really fancy, you're probably not gonna borrow somebody else's suit. You're gonna have one tailored to yourself. So there's a similar idea with sort of the main um, pieces of economic design that you think of in a platform. Oh, thank you. Um, and just to walk through an example of, um, you know, something that I think of as an extremely challenging design problem that I know a lot of different firms in the industry have worked on, is um, how to design a token curated registry. Um, so is there familiarity? Um, how many folks in the audience know what a TCR is? Um, about a quarter. All right. And so a token curated registry is a decentralized way of making a list. Uh, so the way I like to describe this is that I live in Los Angeles, um, and for a very long time, we had basically one food critic. I mean, there were many, but like Jonathan Gold was the king of food in Los Angeles. And he, wrote, he worked for the LA Times, and he had a documentary made about him, which I heard is really good. And every year he had his list of the 100 best restaurants in Los Angeles. And if you were on it, you were like set, right? Like you could be a tiny mom and pop Mexican place and you got on his list and you were in business for the next decade. And if you weren't, well, good luck. Um, and so somebody might say, you know, how do you, maybe Jonathan Gold has too much power. And unfortunately he's no longer with us, but suppose you said, okay, you know, this one guy has way too much power for the restaurant industry. We're gonna create a similar list, but we want it to be crowdsourced. So rather than having a single person make this list, we're gonna have a group of people vote on this list. So how do you get people, you know, the design of a token curated registry is all about how do you sort of end up with the type of, of list and content that you want. And so there, there's variations in design, but sort of a typical type of, of token curated registry would be something like the following. So, we want to make a list of restaurants, and people are going to vote on them. But we don't want any restaurants. We want good restaurants, right? So here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to introduce a native token. And the people, in order to vote, you're going to need to buy a token. And naturally, you know, the token holders are going to want the token price to go up. So what we anticipate is that if these users are holding the token, they'll vote for good restaurants so that people want to look at the list. And then in order to get on the list, restaurants will actually have to buy the token as well. And through this mechanism, we'll get an increase in the value of the token. Yay. <laughs> and so the thing I just want to emphasize is that, you know, when I first read about these, a TCR, is an, this is an extremely complex system. And there's lots of different actors in here that we need to do different things, right? We need the, to the voters to vote for what we think of as good restaurants. We need viewers to come and look at the list. We you know, want restaurants to buy tokens in order to be voted on. And so when I look at a system like this, it's very, it's very well possible that there are settings where this kind of design would work well. But the question is, how do we know? Right, how do you go through, I wanna go through this and say, okay, for each of these different actors, how do we know that they're gonna do what we want them to do? And I think that's where economic design can come in. All 
right? We have another Bitcoin. Part two, how do we do this? All right, so when we think about the process of engaging in economic design, you know, this is relatively new in a blockchain space, um, but this is actually something that's been done a lot in non-blockchain settings. And you know, one of the concerns we hear is, um, you know, a lot of these systems that you know, people in this room and people in the industry are trying to build, they've never been built before, right? So how do we know what works? And this is actually a problem. I mean, if you think about it, there are actually lots of different types of markets that have been designed. So uh, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, um, in 1997 designed an auction for spectrum. So they were auctioning off, they needed to allocate spectrum. Um, they had previously used, what they actually did was they were trying to figure out what to do. And before they had the auction, they actually had a lottery so everyone who entered the lottery had an equal chance of winning Spectrum. So there, they had a piece of Spectrum that was allocated, I think, to a phone company and got awarded to a, a consortium of dentists. And so they said, okay, that's a terrible idea. So we're gonna have an auction. And it's a very complex combinatorial auction. Um, similarly, if any of you know anyone who's been through the residency match for doctors, um, that was a system that was just designed. They went to a set of professors who did the relevant research and said, can you you know, launch this multi-million dollar labor market? And the process that they went through for, this, for them was actually very similar. And involves, you know, for anyone involved in you know, the scientific process, this is very familiar. Sort of, you say, you know, what, do, what does our theory say about what we think is gonna happen? What do we think are sort of the fundamental drivers of behavior and design? Um, can we find observational evidence Right, if we look into the world, what data is available that tells us whether or not we're on the right track. Um, and then third, you know, can we run field and lab experiments? You know, a lot of economic systems are tested either through explicit lab experiments um, or through running field pilots. You know, how do we see if we're on the right track? And then you finally launch. Right, and so although this might seem, you know, quite daunting when you're the, the owner of the platform, there are, there are lots of examples where there, this has actually turned out extremely well. Um, I heard a story for the Spectrum auction that the head of the FCC actually, um, they had written him two speeches for the day that the auction went live, and one of them was, good job, like everything's great, and the other one was like, the scientific process is challenging and difficult and filled with mistakes. So he only needed the first one. All right. So this is probably the most words you're gonna see. Um, this is what we call our house framework at Prison Group. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things that's really awesome about working in blockchain as an economist is the number of different areas that you get to think about. You know, and this is sort of intuitive because as we all know, these systems are extremely complex and there's lots of different moving parts. And that also means there's lots of different parameters for design. And we actually had to think a lot about this. I've actually, um, you know, so typically if you're, you know, an academic researcher, you might do research, you know, sort of in this box or in this box. You know, this is drawn in a lot of different areas. And so you have to figure out, you know, how do you bring them all together in a way that's understandable to people who don't want to, you know, nobody wants to get 300 pages of, of <laughs> mathematical papers in their email and be told to read them. So this is, you know, us trying to, you know, Talk about what are the different factors. And so when we think about, you know, what are the important elements of design for any blockchain platform? You know, the first one is, of course, it's the value proposition. And this typically does not come from us. This comes from the expertise of the teams that we're working with. Um, but it's important to know, you know, what is it that you want to do? Who do you want to be using this? You know, are they going to be able to use complex technology or not? You know, who are your target customers? What are their current options? So we can think about you know, the value that you want to bring. Um, secondly, you know, typically you've, you've raised some money. And then we get into um, what we call the incentive layer. And so for a lot of folks who are, who are going in, um, who are starting their journey into crypto economics, if they really think of crypto economics as tokens. So we show this diagram and we say, okay, we're gonna be working with all of this. And they say, okay, why are the, why are the tokens here? What is all this stuff? 
Um, but there's actually a, a number of layers besides uh, levers besides tokens that you can use to design and such at some blockchain platforms. And so this is this sort of central piece that we talk about first. And you know you can think about this as you know you start small and build out. Um, so the first thing we think about is what we call contract and transaction design. So this is you know you've got a miner and a platform, you've got a buyer and a seller, you've got two people who have agreed that they're gonna do business together. How do you maximize the probability that that actually goes well? Right, how do you maximize the probability that uh, the person who's agreed to provide work is actually gonna do that work? How does the contract verify that that work has been done? How do you know that payment has been sent? What happens if there's a dispute? You know, going back to the eBay example, a lot of times disputes are well-meaning on both sides. So how do you ensure that there's a process that if something doesn't go quite, for, so first you maximize the probability that you know, the platform does what you want, people behave in good faith, and then secondly, how do you set up systems so that um, you can resolve disputes if they don't? And as I mentioned earlier, you know, having this kind of security is great for getting people to you know, consider using your platform for whatever it is you're, you're designing it for. Uh, the second piece is called market design. And this is stepping back. So you're saying, okay, you know, before you have people transact, you need to have them find each other, right? And this is slightly easier if you're thinking about miners, but you can think about having buyers and sellers. And so how do you set up a system that, so the buyers and sellers can find each other? And this is why I think you know the Netflix example again is not a two-sided market. That the movies don't get to chop, the movies don't get to choose who is watching them, but it's a great illustration of how you know thinking about what are the search costs, what, how difficult is it for people to find each other, what kind of information can I give to help with that, and then also thinking about you know pricing mechanisms. Um, so I know a lot of people in blockchain are interested; they're very excited about auctions. So you can get whole books on auction theory. Um, but auctions are only one type of way to set price. Right, so if I go down to you know, Uniqlo, I don't have to go through an auction to buy pants. Right, They're, they have what's called a posted price. You also have sort of haggling or negotiation. So there are different ways that you can set prices. They have different implications for you know, who's gonna get what surplus. Um, and they're, they're made for different reasons, so that's a, that's a deliberate decision. The third set is information systems. And this includes what you would think of as reputation. Um, and what's really in question here is that, you know, what information do you as the platform founder need to collect and distribute to your users so that they can use the platform well, right? So for example, um, I mean, any kind of reputation would work. Let's switch to Airbnb. Right, I mean, the Airbnb reputation mechanism, I think it's just stars, but it has all sorts of pieces that go into it, where the platform said, okay, what is it that we want people to know about hosts and um, guests, and how do we display that in a way that people will have meaning and they'll understand, okay, this, you know, this person doesn't clean the apartment that they're renting out, so I shouldn't stay there. Um, and then after we think about those pieces, we think about the token. And so here, really, the point of the token is to support the other activity on the platform. And I know that there are folks who are continuing to think about how do you launch your own cryptocurrency. There's issues with that, but we're really, you know, we think about what is it for a lot of platforms, you know, if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, your token is designed to be a means of exchange. So how do we make that a really great means of exchange so that, it, you know, it's an attractive currency and people want to use it? Or, you know, it might not have any use at all and it's just, you know, a token that's supposed to increase in price at 20% a year, and you need to figure out how to do that. Um, so the token is really supporting the rest of the, the system. And then the final step is thinking about governance. And when we think about governance, it's really about how does the platform evolve over time? Uh, so we talk to teams who will say, you know, our goal is that in five years, we're not here anymore, right? The corporate center has dissolved, and the platform is running entirely on its own. So obviously the, the users are going to need to make decisions. So what are the processes that you're going to leave in place so that they can do that even when you're gone? Anybody else hear the thumping? No, 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 no. How much time do I have? Uh, 
Okay, another five minutes. Um, so I'm happy to, I won't go through all of these, but you know, what we think about, you know, there's sort of two types of, of economics sort of engaging with the platform. There's design, which is thinking about, you know, what does you want to do in building something from the ground up? And there's also thinking about sort of auditing. Um, and the other type of work we'll do is we'll work with a team that has a mature design and we'll just say, you know, we have this, going back to the idea of being the harbinger of doom, we have this huge list of things that can go wrong. And so we'll go through and say, you know, for each of the mechanisms you've designed, do we see any potential money pumps or scams or sort of things that, that could potentially be bad? And I have like eight slides of this um, for the different subsets, but I won't go through that. Happy to share offline. This is our governance wheel. One of the professors on the panel on Monday was like, wow, you guys are really into consulting frameworks. Like, <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and I'll just end with, I really like this quote. Um, one of my thesis advisors also really liked this quote. And so now I thank you, Professor Roth. I'm taking it from you. Um, John Maynard Keynes was a father of, of modern economics, and he said, if economists could manage to get themselves thought of as humble, competent people on a level with dentists, that would be splendid. Um, and what I think is particularly relevant here is this idea that, you know, not, you know, I've talked to some folks who were from countries where the IMF came in and ruined their economy. There are other kinds of economists. There are game theorists, there are finance um, experts, and they can really sort of bring a set of tools that have been tested and used and can be used to help figure out the economic systems that support blockchain. And so it's kind of like being a dentist. <laughs> um, so again, I'm Stephanie Herter. This is all of my various contact information. I'm always happy to talk about um, economics or the industry or anything in between. So thank you very much.